Hi everybody, welcome to the Retune YouTube channel. My name's Tom Ryder, I am the founder of Retune, and I'm here today with Natasha Devon, MBE, who has recently authored this book, A Beginner's Guide to Being Mental and A to Z, and we're gonna have a little chat about that. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I just wanna start with the title of the book. Yes. Being Mental, mm -hmm. um, it's provocative, it is a term that is used a lot everybody's got someone who thinks he or she is mental um, but the other side to it, the point you make is that we're all mental, we all have a brain, we all have um, the psychological aspect to us so, so how does that work for you? Yeah, the title was in many ways me trying to reclaim the word because you're right, mental is used as a pejorative for, and you know, used, people who have experienced mental illness like myself um, I've lost count of the number of times where people have, have used the word mental as a weapon to try and silence me. And so I wanted to reclaim it so that you, you, know, you could just say, yeah, I am and so are you because we each have a brain. And you know, the theme, if there is a theme to this book, it is all about language and the power of language. Mm. And there are certain things that I would um, advise against saying because they um, create the wrong impression, but with the word mental, I thought, what, why don't we have a go at changing the meaning? So the book is a very personal tale. There's a lot, a lot of personal stories in there. How did it go from that to thinking, I want to be involved in mental health. I want to campaign. I want to be an activist. Yeah, the, the book actually follows the same format as the talks that I do in schools, where it's sprinkled with my experiences because I think it's important for people to know that I live it, that gives you more credibility, with then this, the kind of middle section is about science and understanding the way that your brain works and how that relates to um, the, our environment. And then the third section is kind of your kind of takeaway tips and here's mm. how it applies to you in your life. So the book is very much set out like that. Um, I think for me, um, it, it all started because I felt that education was a really good place to start and because you've got a captive audience. You know, if I went to my mm -hmm. local town hall and said, I'm, I'm going to do a talk on mental health, yeah. bearing in mind I started doing this 12 years ago, no one would have turned up back then. But I thought, well, in schools, they, they kind of have to go. It's compulsory. So yeah. I have an opportunity here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, but I felt that, it, certainly in terms of my education, whilst I, I went to a great school, I think, and I was very lucky to have any mental health education at all, a lot of people my age didn't. Um, it was very much about awareness raising. So it was, this is what it's like to be sectioned with depression or to be on the streets because you've got drug and alcohol dependency issues or mm. you know to nearly die of anorexia. And whilst so they- mongering stuff, yeah. Yeah, well they were interesting and they were always very charismatic, these people that came in. So we, we're you know, teenagers, so we were engaged with it. But what we didn't do was we didn't apply it to ourselves because mm. we hadn't been through anything like that yet. And it just struck me as really silly because we don't do that with physical health. We acknowledge everyone's got a body and, yeah. and we, you know, we talk about it. There's this kind of continued dialogue. So it's trying to make the mental health model more like the physical health model. Mm. And actually how I started was I interviewed 500 teenagers and I asked them what they wish they'd been taught in PSHE, it's personal health and social education. And the top answer at the time was body image, closely followed by self-harm. Um, closely followed by academic anxiety. Right. But the trends change, this is an ongoing process, so now um, they mostly want to know about relationships, consent, sexuality, gender, hmm. and of course social media. Yeah, that brings me on to the next bit actually, <laughs> um, we can't really get away from social media and it is a double-edged sword, it's, it's the power to publish, it's the power to get your thoughts out into the world, it's, it can be a, a great creative tool, but there is both sides to it. In what ways for you is it a helpful tool and in what ways is it is it not? Well, the evidence shows that social media can actually be positive for your well-being. And this is quite new, this research, but if you are using it to communicate with like-minded people, find your tribe, particularly if you feel isolated because, for example, you have mental illness, that can be really positive if you're engaging with it. If you're mindlessly scrolling 
and you're comparing, for example, the photos that you see on Instagram with your own life negatively, then that's when it impacts your well-being in, in a negative way. So it's about how you use it rather than social media in itself, which is why it's so frustrating that now former health secretary Jeremy Hunt, mm. <laughs> newly former, but you know, yes. whenever he was asked about young people's mental health, he always only really gave one answer, which was social media, very conveniently, because mm. obviously he has no jurisdiction over that. Sure. <laughs> and beyond social media, looking at the media, I wanted to talk mm. a little bit about the mental health media charter that you've been working very hard on. Yes. So that idea came about because Charities like the Samaritans, I, I think they're considered to be the, the gold standard. They have these media guidelines and it's just, you know, anybody who wants to write or speak about mental health, it's a steer on how to do that responsibly. And they are just so massive. Mm. <laughs> and whilst, you know, very, very useful, I'm thinking, right, okay, I'm a journalist on a deadline. Am I going to wade through these, before, you know, before I get my article out? And I also found that people were... Um, saying that they'd adhere to the guidelines when they hadn't. Particularly, I found this was true of um, eating disorders and the BEAT guidelines. Mm. And they were almost using it as an excuse to get away with stuff. They'd be like, I was fine because we asked BEAT. And I'm like, you, did, you didn't. And, yeah. and, and so I wanted mm. to stop that from happening. So I actually consulted with um, Samaritan's BEAT and Mental Health First Aid England. And I also did a survey of people who have experience of mental illness and their families and just found out from all of them, look, if we can boil this down to what is the most and least helpful in terms of what people say and write. And we came up with these seven pieces of guidance, which, which is the Mental Health Media Charter. And because they're so simple and crystallized, there's no getting out of it. Like, yeah. <laughs> these are the rules yeah, yeah. and this is what you have to do. So I'm, I'm pleased There's to, one place to find them as well. Yeah. It's not yeah, scattered around. Yeah, yeah, you can find them on my website. There's complete transparency with it. So I'm pleased to say about 50 outlets have signed up so far. And I want to get it to a point where people look for the stamp. There's a stamp that says, you know, we've signed up to the charter. And I want the consuming public to start looking for it. Mm, sure.